Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Paul, for the introduction and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, yeah, um, I'm glad to speak here. Um, let me briefly uh, share my screen. Um, do you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah, so um, this talk is um, <clears throat> um, on the one hand about applications, but uh, first and foremost about uh, methods, about uh, also about concepts, because it turns out when you work in applications that uh, often the concepts that you need um, have not been invented yet. And if you try to um, define the right quantities that you need and the right formal concepts for root cause analysis, um, then there can be two, uh, two sorts of uh, uh, reactions from reviewers, either uh, that tell you everything is obvious uh, from the beginning or they tell you uh, it's too sophisticated, nobody needs that, but uh, it's sometimes hard to get something in between. Um, so <laughs> I hope uh, you will consider it as something in between. Um, yeah, so um, what is it about um, root cause analysis in complex systems or more general understanding complex systems? Um, I mean, I work for AWS or uh, cloud computing is for instance, uh, very, um, complex system with a lot of dependent services calling each other and um, there's a lot of uh, behavior you want to understand. Um, there are anomalies, there are distribution changes, so whatsoever. And um, <clears throat> the perspective from which, uh, no, let me, so let me start with the outline. So, um, I first want to explain the general idea in an informal way, the, the idea of attributing behavior of a target to different mechanisms. So uh, just a modular perspective. Um, then to introduce the formalism of causal attribution, uh, root cause of analysis of outliers and uh, distribution change as examples. Um, then I will talk about the practical implementation and challenges. So the implementation in the open source library do why, and um, how can we infer all that from data, these quantities that we consider crucial, and how do the methods scale. But first, um, I should advertise a bit the open source library do uh, to which we contributed uh, several of our methods. So um, all the methods I'm talking about today are meanwhile in do why. Um, and I will encourage the audience to, to further contribute and also to improve on the methods, but let me talk about that later. Um, so the modular perspective uh, I'm talking about is based on the graphical model um, view. Uh, so um, a causal Bayesian network um, in the following sense. Um, you have nodes that stand for variables, um, some measurements here in our applications that can be latencies of some services that can be some quantities in the logistic chain or whatsoever. Um, we have a causal DAG, a causal directed acyclic graph or a causal graph um, um, that shows um, cause effect relations between the variables. So the error just means that this variable influences the other variable. And um, 
if this is uh, if this graph is the causal structure then the joint distribution factorizes according to the graph in the sense that the joint distribution is just the product of the conditional distributions of each variable given its parents so it's uh, direct causes and actually this formula is the most important one you have to keep in mind in this talk because um, this formula is uh, comes with an important interpretation for us namely that each of these conditional distribution of a variable given its direct causes formalizes a mechanism so this a module in this modular perspective of the world and um, if you want a more fine-grained description then you can also uh, describe it in a uh, deterministic way where every variable is a function of its parents and an unobserved noise variable that is not explicitly uh, shown in the model. So this is just a structural causal model is um, usually in econometry, um, but of course nonlinear in general. Um, so we can either think of these conditional distributions here as one mechanism or of this structural equation as one mechanism. And here, just as an example for visualization, this is some node of interest at xj. And the red ones are the parents, for instance. So um, this uh, the corresponding mechanism describes how this quantity is generated from its parents. Um, okay, why are these mechanisms so interesting? Because they come, at least for us um, and for many other people, with uh, a lot of uh, philosophical preconceptions about the world and um, uh, and these are, for instance, phrased uh, in terms of the principle of independence of mechanisms. So um, one way, so the independence of mechanisms uh, has been phrased in many different ways, and all of them are somehow related, but not identical. So uh, first, the idea that um, we can change um, one of the mechanism without the effect, uh, without affecting the others. Um, second, um, they don't share information in the sense that if you learn something about some of these mechanisms, you don't know anything about the others. This is uh, maybe the uh, most abstract. Uh, part of the independence of mechanisms. I don't want to go much into that. Uh, the first one is the most interesting one for this talk. Um, so the idea that the change independently across data sets, or if we manipulate something at the system, then uh, it's quite likely that we change only one of it or only few of it, but not all of them. And the independence of noise, so in the structural equation, the, these noise variables are thought to be independent unless we have some hidden common causes. So it's also uh, part of this independence of mechanisms in a certain sense. So um, this is um, uh, discussed in our book. So we uh, devoted to one section to it with historical overview and a lot of um, background connections between them. Um, let me start with toy examples with three variables. So for instance, if we have uh, two parents of a common child, 
when the joint distribution is just uh, the distribution of these two parents and a term that describes how the child is uh, generated from its parents or a causal chain where each um, variable is just generated from the one before. So x1, then x, uh, yes, x2, x1, it's, it's just uh, swapped, the position is swapped, but the formula is right. So, um, <clears throat> Yeah, and another complex system that uh, people may think of when they think of Amazon as a supply chain. So this is a highly simplified version. I don't want to go into the details there. So um, it's the for inventory planning, for instance, uh, you have a forecast, some simulations and the bidding process. And uh, this is how uh, this quantity influence the inventory level. And then uh, you can factorize the joint distribution of all these quantities according to the graph. And here you can see that these mechanisms really represent some different parts of the company. So that Therefore, it's it's rather intuitive. Um, okay, and uh, a postulate this is uh, that is tightly connected with this independence of mechanism idea is the so-called sparse mechanism shift hypothesis. That um, in this form it has been phrased by. Uh, Schoenkopf and collaborators in a paper about uh, causal representation learning. Um, rephrased in my words, it says, try to explain changes of the joint statistics by changes of as few mechanisms as possible. So let's say we observe that this, the joint statistics of all these quantities in the supply chain shows week over week changes. So here's the old distribution, the blue one, and then the new one, the red one with a tilde. Then we try to explain these changes by the change of one of the mechanisms. So it could be that um, of this from among these four mechanisms, only the one that generates x3 from x1 and x2 has changed. So only here's the tilde, the red one is the tilde. Um, and this is what we mean also by explaining the changes, because then we know the, this is the mechanism we have to blame for this change. Um, so other limitations of the sparse mechanism shift hypothesis should we always believe that only a small number of mechanisms changed? So I have a short answer that just says, no, it's just a working hypothesis. So sense of Occam's razor, try to find simple explanations if possible. But there's also a longer answer. It's about modeling. Um, simultaneous change of many mechanisms may indicate that the model missed a common cause. And just to show you an example. So here if a model with three variables, um, simple, complete DAG, how we call it, um, where we observe that in the new distribution, all the mechanisms changed. So violating the sparse mechanism shift hypothesis, but it could be potentially because we missed a common cause x0 because if uh, just the distribution of this common cause changed, then we can also observe that in the factorization above, all the conditional change. So uh, when too many conditional change simultaneously, then uh, there we have some reasons to believe that uh, there is a common cause behind it. So nothing 
happens simultaneously without a common cause. It's, it's also a kind of Reichenbach's principle on the philosopher Reichenbach. Um, <clears throat> uh, just a side note, um, the relation to causal representation learning, because as I said, it was um, taken from a paper about causal representation learning. Try to find representations such that sparse mechanism shift hyperbasis holds. So um, first, the condition of causal sufficiency. So don't miss common causes. Um, you are allowed to drop causes that influence only one variable because this is just a less detailed description. But in this framework, in work in the graphical model framework, you are not allowed to drop variables that influence two or more. Um, and the second one, so a difficult question, what is the right cost graining? So uh, define the right aggregations of variables. Of course, in complex systems, you have lots of different levels of aggregation. And if you think of thermodynamics, um, then uh, there's the level of atoms, but there's also the level of um, let's say gas theory of the thermodynamics where, where you just describe a gas by some macro variables instead of uh, looking at the single atoms. And I think uh, similar things hold about modern complex systems, uh, like supply chain or whatsoever too. And uh, constructing these representations is, of course, a um, big challenge for artificial and human intelligence. Um, okay, but um, uh, I want to continue with the idea of what do we do with this uh, mechanism change, uh, with this description of mechanism changes. So. If you think of root cause analysis of anomalies, so you're given an observation. Um, so uh, lowercase letters are always specific observations and uppercase letters are variables. So given an observation that doesn't look like those that are drawn from the usual distribution, um, we could also apply the sparse distribution shift hypothesis and assume that for this anomaly, only one or few of the mechanisms are corrupted. So if you observe um, an anomalous behavior in, let's say, target quantity of the supply chain, then you would, as a first hypo working hypothesis, assume that only one of the components failed. And if several of them fail together, then you would again ask what is the common cause of all of them. Um, and uh, if several of them fail, then you want to quantitatively attribute the anomaly to all contributing mechanisms. And actually, it's a special case of the distribution change where only um, one data point from the new distribution is given. So you have uh, this anomaly, and this is one data point in the new distribution. Um, for instance, in this supply chain, you could try to explain the anomalous value x5 by the corruption of just one of these mechanisms, for instance, the one generating x3 from x1 and x2. Um, we have a slightly different uh, question. Um, it's a concept that we call intrinsic causal contribution, ICC. Um, it asks which mechanisms should we blame for the fluctuations, for instance, the variance of a target variable. And the idea is um, the contribution of each of the mechanisms to the variance of the target is the variance reduction after replacing that mechanism with an appropriate deterministic one. And uh, we want to define this contribution in a way that deterministic mechanisms don't 
get uh, any contribution at all. So we ask um, um, which of the components introduce the indeterminism, the statistical fluctuations that you observe in the end. And those that are deterministic don't contribute her here by definition. <clears throat> And uh, just to, to get it a bit more concrete, um, what, uh, how this is related to my everyday work, um, causal contribution analysis for dependent services in cloud computing. So a target quantity could be the user experience latency of the entire service. And here we have a causal structure because if a service A calls a service B, then the latencies propagate from B to A. Um, uh, so this is at least the first approximation, also a working hypothesis. There will be many violations of this principle, but um, as a first approximation, uh, we state that the causal graph is the service graph with the arrows inverted if we are talking about how latency is propagated. And uh, what kind of questions could we ask here? So for instance, root cause analysis of anom anomalies would ask, identify services that caused sudden increase of latency. Root cause analysis of distribution change could ask, identify services that caused increase of latency in a day-to-day -day comparison. So if people run it, uh, the service several days. Intrinsic causal contribution ask, um, identify the services that contribute the most to the fluctuations of latencies. And um, there's a very interesting semi-real data set um, colleagues of mine uh, have published now, they, they published the, the, the application. So it's basically a toy application. It's um, an online pet shop that is just um, hypothetical, but it really runs. So you can see the pets and uh, you can play around with it. And uh, it really consists of AWS services that interact and you can uh, you can observe how latencies propagate and all that and they they analyze this data set this is to appear on archive soon um, okay um, when when I started my talk, I uh, emphasized uh, that yeah. these are concepts that were missing. Um, and um, in order to explain that a bit more, um, I want to also explain why those concepts that are well known uh, are not sufficient. And I think the, the most, let's say, most popular um, quantification of causal influence is um, average causal effect, uh, ACE. It quantifies the impact of one variable on another, xi on xj here. Um, I'm used to Pearl's notation, so uh, I know that in this community maybe other notations are more common. Uh, but uh, what I'm saying is just here, uh, the, the, the mean of xj given that I set xi to the value lowercase xi, and you compare that to the mean you get if you set xi to a different value. And this difference, uh, for instance, if xi is binary, then is, it's the well-known average uh, causal effect um, or average treatment effect. Um, <clears throat> Why is this substantially different? Uh, why is causal contribution substantially different uh, from causal contribution I'm talking about? So for instance, the root cause analysis of anomalies, and the, um, the causal effect from Xi to Xj 
doesn't tell us anything about whether the mechanism at Xi worked properly. And um, likewise, distribution change, um, it doesn't tell us whether this uh, mechanism changed. And it doesn't tell us either whether this mechanism contributes to the variance. So if you have a chain of um, events like thunderstorm causes power outage, this causes server outage, and this causes revenue drop, then um, the treatment effect of usual interventions on server outage on revenue may be large, but the variable server outage was not the root cause of the revenue drop because um, this node just showed its usual behavior. So the, um, the root cause was, was further upstream. And uh, this example also shows that root cause analysis uh, is relative to the variable sets you have observed. So um, uh, it depends on how far you go back um, in this backtracking process. Um, so let me be a bit more concrete about root cause analysis of distribution change and how this is defined in a quantitative manner. So uh, we observe that the distribution of some uh, target quantity of interest Xn uh, changed from P to P tilde. And we want to quantitative attribute this change to the different mechanisms. Um, so um, a priori, we can allow that all of these mechanisms changed, although we believe that's only a few, or we hope for the analysis that's only a few, because this is the more interesting case. Um, then we do a computation where we would replace step-by-step step the old mechanisms with the new ones according to some random order, and then observe how the distribution changes step-by-step. Step. Um, for instance, when we um, consider the mean, um, the, the uh, difference of the means, then we can see that uh, we get step-by-step step from one mean to the final mean, and this defines the contribution of each of the mechanisms um, to this uh, change of means. Uh, so, so these contributions sum up to the observed difference. But unfortunately, this contribution depends on the order of replacing the mechanisms. Um, in order to fix this, to get rid of this ambiguity and ill-definedness, we use Shapley values and just average over all potential orderings. This is a computationally heavy step, but it can be appro approximated. So we'll talk about that later. It's just um, to have a good concept, we average over that uh, in order to get rid of this ambiguity. Um, so, a toy example of uh, a supply chain, also a very simplified model of a supply chain that can be found in DoY, that's a toy data set where we have um, the quantities forecasted demand, capacity constraints. This um, results in submitted purchase orders and this uh, results in confirmed orders and this results in received orders. So this is the causal structure here with just um, five variables. When you observe the week over week changes, then you see that um, most of the variables, so all but one have changed. So constraint was the only one that didn't change from week over week. So they the yellow one. Um, so the simple ad hoc analysis just tells us almost everything changed from week to over week. But um, 
the contribution analysis shows that it's just two mechanisms that have changed, uh, confirmed and demand. And um, to show that this can be easily implemented in do well to why just um, uh, briefly mention the API. So this is just how you um, define the graph. So the, the causal structure needs to be pro provided. This is also something I will talk about later. Um, it's a bottleneck one has to be honest about that. Uh, where does this graph come from? I will talk about that later. Um, then here, um, this is how you call um, distribution change. So we have just have this uh, command gcm dot distribution change and then data week one, data week two, and um, for the quant target quantity received, and then it produces the above plot. So this is a simple, it's pretty easy to use, uh, just to mention that. But um, I also want to talk a bit more about the details of the root cause analysis of outliers. Um, and uh, what is done mathematically. Um, again, we assume that uh, we are given the causal graph, but we also assume a bit more. We also assume that we are given the structural equations. And if we recursively insert the structural equations into each other, we can write the target function the target variable just in terms of the noise variables, just uh, some function capital F um, with all the noise variables as, as inputs. And um, then we want to assess um, the importance of each of the noise variables for the observed anomaly by setting it to normal baseline values and computing whether it results in Xn being normal. So the function f is computed from the structural equations and this generates us counterfactual values Xn that would have been observed had we set some of the noise values to normal ones. And of course, the big question, the crucial question for the root cause analysis is which of the noise values do we need to change in order to get a normal value for the target? <clears throat> but um, I tell, told you also that uh, we want um, quantitative root cause analysis in the sense of um, quantitatively attributing the anomaly to the mechanisms. And uh, in order to do that, we first define an anomaly score, which is basically just um, minus log probability. So, um, it just quantifies how unlikely the event is. Um, so here, G is some feature map. So if you just read this formula, it tells you um, how unlikely is it that the function G of X is even larger than the observed value G of X or of the same size. And then you take minus log for quantifying the unlikeliness of that event. Um, so for instance, um, you can have a one-sided tail probability where the anomaly score is just minus log of the probability of observing even larger values or distance from the mean. Uh, this is just a way that um, uh, to to phrase it uh, um, in a uh, 
very modular fashion and, and general way um, because it captures also non-numeric data. It also captures multivariate uh, quantities and all that um, to show that it's a quite general formalism. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I get. I don't want to go too much in the detail, just to to give you an impression of that. Um, what we want to quantify is um, to what extent does a certain um, mechanism make the outlier less likely or more likely, and uh, in order to do that, we um, consider the quotient of the probability of the outlier event, given that we randomize all variables. Um, no, sorry, uh, I should uh, have mentioned the random order of the labels. First, we start with some random order of the labels, and then we randomize all variables that are earlier according to this ordering and evaluate the probability of the outlier event and compare that to the probability that we obtain when we randomize all variables earlier, including nj itself. So it describes the factor by which randomizing NJ decreases the probability of the anomaly. And then we have, uh, again, the problem that uh, this contribution uh, depends on an arbitrary ordering of nodes. And then we symmetrize overall orderings, um, which uh, makes it a sharply value-based concept. And uh, for these um, Shapley values, we have also the decomposition formula that the total score decomposes into the contributions of the mechanisms. So you can quantitatively tell how many percent of the anomaly has been generated by a particular mechanism. Um, if you have uh, just uh, to see that concept at work, if you have a logical mm -hmm. end gate where Y is just the end of D different inputs, then um, the outlier score is the sum of the input outlier scores. So let's say um, X1, X2, and XD are all binary variables that stand for rare events. Then um, minus log of the probability of the target being one is minus the sum of the logarithms of the probabilities of each of the inputs being one. And then it turns out that the contribution of xj is just minus log the probability. And um, if we interpret that, it turns out that only rare events can get high contribution, uh, which makes sense because frequent events um, don't appear as good explanations. So even if their logical role is equivalent, so if Y is just uh, an end of several inputs, we would still attribute Y being one more to the rare events because uh, these are the unexpected ones. Those that are one almost all the time wouldn't get a high contribution by construction. Um, and so this um, dependence on rarity is not put in by hand. It's just a result of this concept. Um, 
So it aligns with our intuition. So uh, historically strong drop of Dow Jones cannot be explained by an event that happens twice a week. We would not really call that an explanation. So it's this is also a bit about uh, psychology or philosophy, what we would consider an explanation. And I think it aligns with our intuition. Um, so here, Oh, I have just a data example with two dice, uh, a one with four different values and the one with 100 different values. Um, and uh, the outlier score of the event 1-1 one, one is the logarithm of four times 100. And the contribution of each of the dice to this outlier event is log four or log 100 respectively. So it's 27% versus 77% of the outlier score, just as an example. Um, so as a summary, the root cause analysis of anomalies um, uh, describe a scale independent quantification via probabilistic scores. It explains anomalies in terms of ancestor anomalies via structural causal models. And it quantifies contribution via counterfactual change of log probabilities, which achieves comparability across measures with different units. And nodes with highest contributions are called root causes here. Um, I think I have to cut some parts a bit. Um, um, because I, I also want to give you a user guide for what I said. Um, so estimating this contribution is challenging. So we have this inaccuracy of the structural equations. So where do the structural equations come from? And we have uh, high computational load. If we really properly want to evaluate this uh, combinatorial impression expression, um, <clears throat> but uh, if there is a unique root cause, we can work with rather bad approximations. And uh, finding good simplifications and proxies for the above will be heavily use case specific. And this is a sort of explanation how, how you should understand this talk. Um, so, um, this definition, I've presented this definition in order to show that um, first we should discuss what we mean by root cause analysis. And, um, and I think uh, the quantity we define makes sense. Mm. And even if it's hard to estimate in practice, mm. it's, um, it's a gold standard maybe uh, if we accept that and uh, we have to find good proxies. So it's better to, to work with proxies uh, for a clear concept, but to start with something that is undefined in the first place. So um, the buff is an attempt, attempt of defining what root cause analysis is supposed to mean in the first place and not um, necessarily uh, the way to go if you implement it on large scale. So this is a question I want to talk about later too. Um, so just some remarks on the practical implementation. Um, how would you estimate the structural equations? For instance, you can go for an additive noise model as simplification um, where each node is a function of its parents plus a noise. So that's a parametric restriction, the structural equation. Um, then uh, this function F tilde can be learned via standard regression methods. And the noise values can be computed via the residual terms. So this is how we can reconstruct the noise values for every single instance. 
and talk about counterfactual changes. So what would have happened had the, value, the noise value be different? Um, then we can average over a few random permutations instead of averaging over all permutations as an approximation. Uh, if we have a unique root cause, that shouldn't make a difference, although it's hard to make very general statements about that. Um, just as a real world example with um, the time series of water levels, where we see, um, sorry, I've, this is a causal relation between um, the water levels at two, uh, at four different cities in the UK. And uh, we know the causal structure because uh, we know how the, 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 we know the river topologies. And um, there we did a root cause analysis of the anomalies of the high water level and um, found that um, the downstream uh, water levels were just a result of the upstream anomalies. So we could attribute uh, this downstream anomaly to the upstream water levels. Um, so um, maybe again, I want to go back to, to the general spirit of uh, the principles of causal contribution analysis. So the common structure behind all the above contribution methods is um, we replace mechanisms at each node with a baseline mechanism and <clears throat> look at the impact of the replacement on the target quantity, which defines the contribution of this mechanism. Um, and replacing the mechanisms one after another uh, yields contributions that sum up to the joint contribution. The, so the change from red to black or vice versa. So, and uh, in general, for all these problems, uh, uh, I think the, the problems that arise here um, are always the same, namely, what's the baseline? And um, that the contribution depends on the order of replacements. So um, the second one is solved via this symmetrization. So the Shapley value, um, the baseline, is also something that we need to decide for all these attribution methods separately. I don't want to go to the details there. Um, and uh, I would rather like to talk about uh, a problem that uh, we are asked all the time. Um, how do we know the causal graph? And um, yeah, so in uh, Dubai, we, we need to specify that. Um, I mean, in our use cases, uh, there is a lot of domain knowledge, um, at least partial knowledge is derived from time order causes, precede their effects. The system topology, for instance, dependent services in cloud computing. And uh, of course, a company knows its own supply chain. So um, there's a lot of um, knowledge collected. Um, it's not always clear to what extent we can construct the domain knowledge because uh, my experience showed that um, in order to define a causal graph, uh, it requires both domain knowledge and a lot of causal thinking because uh, it's sometimes it's even a slightly philosophical question. Uh, is this a cause or not? And um, so um, this 
domain knowledge may be incomplete and we should have a way to to check that from data so um the question is to what extent can we test hypothetical graphs and one minimum requirement is the well-known causal markov condition so every node must be conditionally statistically independent of its non-descendants given its parents so here's some node xj and here are the parents the red one the descendants are here and these are non-descendants so given the parents this node needs to be statistically independent of the non-descendants so um, for fixed values of the parents these non-descendants would no longer contain information about xj so the parents screen off the non-descendants and this is um, a minimum requirement also found in Carl's book uh, causality um, yeah uh, how do we test that in practice so a uh, conditional independence testing is hard um, there is even a sense in which it's impossible uh, depending on what you demand uh, the kind of guarantees statistical guarantees you want to have so uh, statistical independence uh, testing requires assumptions um, and um, they have type one error so um, even if the graph is right you will have violations of the Markov condition uh, just by usual statistical errors um, so how do you decide whether it's still a good graph and um, a very skeptical view that um, we started with is is the test result even better than for a random graph so that would be a minimum requirement it should be better than a random graph even we are modest um, um, of course often it is <laughs> um, but um, in order to test whether there are many violations of the Markov condition um, or not we need a fair comparison so uh, when we ask is a graph better than a random graph we also need to generate a good random graph and um, to get a fair comparison we wanted to compare it to graphs with comparable connectivity so we don't want to connect to compare a graph with a lot of connections with one that has almost no connection that is very sparse because the sparse ones will have much more violations of the markov condition because it entails way more conditional independences than the dense one so therefore it's not a fair comparison and a simple method to get a fair comparison comparison is to generate random graphs via permuting variables there are also more sophisticated arguments in favor of that uh, principle um, and we have implemented uh, such a test it's also in do why as a first check for um, how good your causal graphs are um, but um, what can we do if, when uh, domain experts uh, don't know much about uh, the causal graph there's a big field of causal discovery inferring the causal graph from data only um, there's a lot of different approaches meanwhile um, all of them very interesting um the big question is uh, how much can we trust them on real data um so if they are tested on simulated data then um, the simulated data could just reflect authors preconceptions about generating processes in nature and 
with real data, we have the problem that ground truth is rarely known. So one um, way we tried to get around that serious problem is what we call self benchmarking. We apply algorithms to different subsets of variables from a large causal structure and quantify how much it contradicts itself. So that would uh, be, at first glance, it's just a sanity check, but we also argue that it's a bit more because um, it can be a quite strong test. Um, and it really turns out that there's a lot of contradictions. So algorithms often contradict themselves. So here, just a toy example where the right one is the true graph. And if you apply an algorithm to subsets, you may end up with graphs that have a different direction for x causing y or y causing x. And um, if you demand that variables should, uh, that algorithms should at least not contradict themselves, then you have a method where you can train algorithms without bound truth. And this is, um, but this is uh, further research. So it's not, not something that I, I'm suggesting here for, uh, let's say, uh, direct application at industry. Um, so the main references here, I want to give you, these are the papers about different contribution methods. And again, mention uh, do why end to end library for causal inference where my colleagues also contributed a lot. Um, so feel free to contribute improvements also of the methods uh, that I was explaining. Uh, the above is meant to introduce a way of thinking about contribution analysis rather than recommending a specific method. So I would say uh, still as a disclaimer, um, that the specific method needs to be adapted to the specific use case. But the way of thinking, I think this uh, modular perspective, decomposing the world into mechanisms, this is the general spirit that, yeah, I'm convinced of. <laughs> okay, let me close with these remarks. Thank you very Thank much, you. Dominic. Uh, thanks. Uh, great talk. Uh, had everything. Uh, new methods. Uh, we were going to talk about, I think, uh, applications of this. There was already a lot of interest about root cause analysis, but also, um, well, the uh, the user guide, as you called it, uh, directly applicable in, in DUI, uh, and also a part on causal discovery, which is uh, very relevant uh, for our audience, too. So uh, thanks for that.